and welcome to the Constitution Line by Line. I'm Paul Fabrizio. And I'm Don Frazier. I'm history. I'm political science. And we're going to go all the way through the the document that rules the nation, line, line by, by line. line. Do you think one day we should do this with the Declaration of Independence, Jim? Yeah, maybe. We'll see what the, the viewers, resp how they respond. Okay, very good. Something to look forward to. That's right. But right now, we are talking about Article 1. Of the Constitution. Okay. And we're going to move to Section 2. So Article 1, Section 1's done. Now we're going into Section 2. And Section 2, the House of Representatives, Clause 1. <laughs> <laughs> Clause 1. Are we crazy or what? This is fun. All right. Are you ready, Don? I'm ready. Let's okay. Lay it on. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states. And the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. Okay, we're going to have to do some <laughs> unpacking on this. There's all sorts of interesting words and stuff that just came up. There is. All right. Let's start with the first thing. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year. All right, so every other year these guys are running for office. Why? Yeah. And this is this is actually a really important thing. Yeah, I, I, in my opinion, it's because that way you get a diversity of voices, and you can decide if you like the voice that you just elected, and then if you don't, you can toss them out. That's you know that's why I'm kind of against term limits. That thing pops up from time to time because we can chunk these dudes out every other year. Now there's some arguments that they get in there and get embedded, and it's impossible to run against them, which is probably there's some validity to that. Right. In political science, we call that the advantage of incumbency. Yeah, well, that's – I think we call that in you know, every discipline. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I can understand the idea or at least the, the, the impulse to have term limits. But mm -hmm. two years is not that long. Right. And – you know, the first year you spend most of your time figuring out which way the coat closet is and, you know, which way the bathroom is down the hall and, you know, where you can park and where the cafeteria is. Then the second year, you kind of know what you're doing, but then you have to run for office again. So I'm not really sure that these people have a whole lot of time to accomplish much. And considering the fact that they are one of today 435 people See, and they should be one of 30,000 we'll get into that <laughs> later and i'm looking forward to that discussion too yeah should be like the imperial uh, uh. <laughs> so what we've got is our people who get there and then quickly have to focus on their re-election they do and that was by design of the framers they wanted people who were close to the voters. Well, and I, and and, I think that, uh, that, that that's natural. Yeah. Because uh, under the British parliamentary system, it was, uh, you had virtual representation. Mm -hmm. And it was really lined up along class distinctions. Right. So if you were a haberdasher in Norfolk, then you could certainly legislate and represent all the interests of haberdashers across the empire. Right. Whereas in the United States, the realities of this vast expanse of territory meant that if someone was actually going to represent your interest, they had to have the same trouble with the indigenous peoples, yes. <laughs> you know, Indian, pro Indian problems, or they had to have the same, you know, I need a bridge over this Creek that floods periodically problem as you did. Right. So they wanted real representation. Right. And they want you, to see them in HEB. Right. When shopping. You, you, you're making a really important point that is often ignored today, and that is the importance of geography. Yeah, well, geography is huge. And we don't think about this today. Geography is important in the Senate, it's very important in the House. Yeah. You have elected representatives who are familiar with the area, who, because they have to be reelected, have to come back to that area and have on conversations a basis. with yes. people. Yeah. Yeah. So there's actually, I think this is one of my favorite parts of the constitution because I think it's really designed to tie those representatives back yeah. 
to the people who elected them. But that sort of impulse is born of more than 100 years' worth of experience right. of being a frontier nation. And having, if you want to go back to England, it's, what, a six-week trip by yeah. boat. And all the roads seas. go from the uplands to the coast, and they don't go from state to state. Right. So, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of peculiarities to the geography of the United States that helps drive this impulse. Yeah. So every two years— the idea originally with the framers was that people would go to Washington, D.C. or wherever the government was going to meet, actually, yeah. and they would stay there for a while. Then they would come back to their district and stay in their district. A lot of boarding houses in Washington, D.C. Exactly, in those days. exactly. And part of it was, therefore, because all these people come from all over the place, they would have a chance to meet and hang out together yeah. because it would be so difficult to go back to their homes. Yeah. Today, we're in a much different situation because of air travel. It's easy to sure. go back home. And today, we've really evolved into what's sometimes called the Tuesday through Thursday Club, where everybody flies into Washington, D.C. on Monday night, does legislative work Tuesday through Thursday, and then Thursday afternoon or Friday— Catch the plane. Catch the plane com coming back. And I don't know if you've ever been on a plane from D.C. back— but a couple of years ago, I, I flew on a Thursday afternoon. Oh, did you? And there was all these members of Congress on the plane, and there was their legislative staff on the plane. If that plane went down, you know, legislative staff— brain drain, Yeah, man. exactly. The whole state <laughs> of Texas would lose their representatives. So the original idea of the framers in tying the people close— the, tying the representatives close to the people was, you know, every two years you get reelected— it still works today, but for different reasons. Hmm. And now, because it's so easy to come back home, guess what? They're back in their districts on a very regular basis. Hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things I'm always curious about, and this might be too technical, but hmm. I track how often our member of Congress comes here to Abilene compared to other politicians. Oh, wow. And? And our member of Congress, doesn't matter which one, in the time I've been tracking, yeah. three different members of Congress, both parties, they come back here on a much more regular basis than other elected politicians. In other districts or in, other elected? In, so for example, our state senate. Yeah. Or how often does the governor come here? Sure. You know, well, our member of Congress comes to Abilene all the time. Our state senator, much less often. Well, that's true, The too. governor, much less often. Yeah. You know, so there's something about this idea, you get elected every two years, that really forces them to reach out to their people. Got to have some face time with the you, constituents. You do. you do. And it's all because of what's in the Constitution. That's cool. It forces a behavior. Now, is this the case for every single member of Congress? No. There's yeah, some who it's not an issue. But I used to live in Baltimore, you know. 50 miles away from Washington, D.C., yeah. we saw our members of Congress, you know, the church I was at, they had a festival. Lo and behold, here comes a the member Con of Congress, you yeah. know. Hey, how you doing? You know, you get to see him. Sometimes you see him too much. <laughs> but that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. The House of Representatives is supposed to represent our feelings, our passions. Our feelings. Our feelings. Now, shouldn't we move the Capitol then to St. Louis? To be right in the middle of the yeah. country? Uh, there's an argument to be made. I don't know about St. Louis. Uh, well, we would Kansas have the, City. the federal district of yeah, whatever cornucopia. Yeah, whatever. but again, we're stuck with geography Yeah, and what the framers did. It would be too difficult today. So Interesting. Interesting right. idea. So in that line, there's also a bunch of stuff about electors this and electors that. Right. And, and, and it says the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for the electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So in other words, what is the qualifications to vote in your state? Okay. And whatever those qualifications are, guess what? You could vote for members of Congress. Too. Okay, because that's going to change. After yes. the Civil War. Yes. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> that is an excellent point. Yeah. yeah. So just a little foreshadowing for everybody <laughs> so that they can track this stuff. So far, what have we learned? 17th Amendment's going to be a big deal to me. To him. <laughs> Civil War changes a bunch of stuff. Yes. And, uh, and geography is important. And the whole idea of 
and geography is important. I guess there's four things. The other thing is how many members in the House of Representatives apportioned by population. Oh, we're going to get into we're math. We're going to get into that in the future, too. There you go. All right, so. That's it. That's it on that line. Yeah. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 1. We finished it. All right. That's the next line of the Constitution that we've knocked out line by line. So we'll be back with the next line.